Hey guys, welcome back to That Florida Feeling. I hope you guys have had a great week. First, I want to give a huge thank you to Matthew for writing my new intro song. I don't know why I forgot to mention this. Uh, Of course, you've heard it on the last couple episodes, but does it just feel like Florida? I love it. I love the intro with the waves and then the music. It's just great. So thank you so much, Matthew. You're amazing. Thank you. Also, big thank you to Brian, excuse me, big Brian McKnight fan. Uh, you are an amazing human being. Thank you so much for the five-star review and the nice comments on Apple Podcast. I, I appreciate that so much. Thank you so much. Thank you also to everybody who participated in the Facebook and Instagram uh, questions and polls. I think we're all chocolate lovers here. At least that's what I feel. Although Skittles are up there. Definitely Skittles. Have you guys bought all your Halloween candy yet? You only got a couple days left. I mean, you could be like me and buy a bag and already eaten it and have to go buy another one. No shame. Is what it is. Or are you going to be like I always say I'm going to do but never actually do? Or are you going to wait till the day after Halloween and then go raid the candy aisle? If you can find it. Because half the time, I swear, I don't know what happens. At midnight on November 1st, Christmas stuff appears out of nowhere. <laughs> but are you ready for Halloween? You have your costumes, your candy. I mean, I hope you guys are doing something fun, whatever you decide to celebrate. Whether it's Spooky Day or Sam Samhain or Day of the Dead. Whichever one you're doing, I hope you guys have a fun time doing it. I figured that I would talk to you about something fitting for this week. Um, I've already mentioned it, and we're going to just talk about it. We're going to talk about the most haunted city in Florida. And it's also kind of fitting that the most haunted is, of course, also the oldest. Now, we know that the oldest is St. Augustine, so therefore the most haunted is obviously also St. Augustine. And we know that it was founded in 1565, And that means that there's been a lot of time for bad things to happen there. And when I say St. Augustine is haunted, I literally mean the entire city is haunted. Ask anybody who lives there, lives there, even outside of the downtown area. uh, That whole area, just there's something about it. And there's no shortage of stories of things moving. You see things out of the corner of your eye. You look and it's not there. You hear things. And just plenty more unexplainable, weird, creepy things just seem to happen in that town. And of course, you kind of just get used to it the longer you stay there. I mean, I see things walking through the apartment all the time. And at first, I freaked out, blamed the cats. And now I'm just like, eh, it is what it is. They were probably here first anyways. But it still catches you by surprise every now and then. So... The first haunting I want to talk to you about is probably one of the most well-known, but it's not actually in the downtown area. Of course, you can see it from the downtown area. You can see it from most anywhere in St. Augustine. And of course, I'm talking about the St. Augustine Lighthouse. Now, the Lighthouse stands as a magnificent structure off of downtown on Anastasia Island. So it's not far from downtown, and it really is a beautiful building. Um, And it's still operational today. You can see it in the early morning, late night. And plenty of people actually still go to visit. You can get a bird's eye view of the whole area. And you can learn a little bit about the history, the grounds, and of course the lightkeeper's house you can go in. And they're all in great condition. And they give you a really good idea of what it would be like to live back then if you had lived in that part of Florida, watched over the lighthouse to keep others safe. Now, the original lighthouse was built in 1824. And this was actually Florida's first lighthouse. And that was really after... They had a version of a lighthouse. The Spanish and British had been using wooden watchtowers and beacons uh, in the area. And that started probably when they settled the area, probably close to 1565. Now, the original lighthouse was actually Coquina, uh, the same structure that's made the Fort Castillo de San Marcos made out of. And the one that was originally there stood kind of close to where the one is today, but it's not there for a reason. It actually fell into the sea in... 1880 thanks to changing coastlines and erosion uh actually you can still see the original tower it's an underwater water archaeological site so if you're down for some diving or from snorkeling it's probably something you should check out so it was replaced obviously by the tower that we know today and it was built better and taller than the first one uh the lighthouse is really it's really an interesting place there's a lot of interesting things that have happened in that area Uh, It's even been through an earthquake where the building swayed, but of course it didn't fall. So it's really, it's really kind of a magnet for things. I don't even know how to describe it. Like when you're in that area, you just get a feeling. And 
kind of when they built this second lighthouse, that's really kind of when some of the hauntings that it's more well known for today kind of began. Now, of course, the construction of the sec- second lighthouse began in the 1870s, um, and Hezekiah Pitty was put in charge to oversee the construction of this new lighthouse. So when he came down, he moved his family uh, from Maine to St. Augustine, and he actually lived on the site where the construction started. So him and his wife and four children stayed on the site with him. Now, of course, children are younger, so they're going to get bored, so they're going to start to play outside, and they're going to turn the entire construction site into a playground, which is fine. I mean, kids do what kids do, and they even got construction worker kids to play with them. So it's kind of a fun thing for everybody. And the really interesting thing about this uh, construction site was that it had a railway cart that they could move supplies from the docks to the actual building site to help with construction so that they weren't having to lug it by animal or hand or whatever. Um, and the children used to love to ride in the cart because it was kind of an early form of a roller coaster for them. And they would ride it down to the water and bring it back and do it again when they weren't needing it for the construction. And they would do this for hours. Now, the only thing actually stopping the cart from going into the water was a wooden board. So you can see where this is going. Sadly, on July 10th, 1873, the three pity sisters, Mary, who was 15, Eliza, who was 13, and Carrie, who was four, along with another girl whose name is unknown, were riding the cart like they did every other time. Except to this day, unfortunately, the board that, started the, that stopped the cart was not in its normal place which meant that the cart went flipping into the water, and the girls were sadly trapped underneath. A worker did witness the accident and went racing to the water. They got there with a couple other people, and they lifted the cart up, but unfortunately it was not in in time. The smallest pity girl, Carrie, was the only one who had survived. Now, of course, the family was devastated. They've just lost two children. Um, Of course, another child was uh, lost. That's a sad thing. And so the family of the, the pity girls just left to go bury their children back in Maine. That's where they were from. That was home to them. They wanted to lay their girls to rest up there. And this kind of really starts the real beginning of the hauntings for the lighthouse. Um, Anytime a child dies, it's, it's tragic, or it just seems more tragic. Now, this accident actually happened 148 years ago, but strange occurrences are still happening to this day. The lighthouse, the grounds it sits on, and the keeper's house are full of strange incidents. So much so that a relief light housekeeper uh, even recalled they were living in the quarters in the 1950s. And they kept hearing feet up, footsteps upstairs. They'd go up there and there was nobody in the, anywhere in there. Uh, lighthouse keeper James Pippin, who was actually the last light keeper to live at the station before it went uh, automated, he lived in the keeper's quarters, but he couldn't do it. He actually moved to a smaller Outlook building after swearing that the main house was haunted. And if you've ever been there... The lightkeeper's quarters are actually very nice, um, large, spacious, really pretty house, but definitely have a vibe to them, to it. Actually, the whole grounds do, like I said. So this guy couldn't even live in the house. Now, I told you that the lighthouse became fully automated, which means that you didn't have to have anybody to live on the grounds because the Coast Guard took over, and so the house just kind of sat there. They got their bright idea to rent out the original lightkeeper's quarters, um, but it never stayed rented long. Uh, Stories of people with small children waking up, appearing by their bed. They don't know. They don't have kids. They don't know where this came from. To only disappear right before their eyes. Footsteps, voices, anything and everything just creeped this whole house out. People just didn't want to live there. You can't really blame them. And so, I don't know if they just finally gave up or everybody knew not to rent there, but they finally gave up it said empty for quite a while actually and then there was a mysterious fire that actually gutted the house leaving it um just in ashes the only thing that was left was actual coquina basement and a couple of boards so call it what you will somebody was squatting something weird happened anything's possible so the light keepers quarters and the lighthouse actually was probably in need of renovation long before that fire but this kind of spurred it on And the All-Volunteer Junior Service League of St. Augustine decided that they were going to make their mission to revamp the whole thing. All of it. So they volunteered and they raised $1.2 million over a span of 15 years to restore all of it to its original state. The volunteers and construction workers reported numerous 
unexplained incidents during this restoration period. And it was always in the area of the keeper's quarters. Um, the basement also seemed to be kind of an active place, but they're not really sure why, because that's the only place that, you know, wasn't burned. Like, it survived the fire. They do say, though, that the spirits are playful and very active, but they don't seem menacing. Now, if you ask a staff member, some may or may not tell you their stories. Um, one actually said that they were closing up one night by themselves, and they heard somebody at the top of the lighthouse giggling. Now, of course, they thought that they had left somebody at the top because at night they have to close up the doors and make sure nobody's up there. And So the guy had gone all the way to the bottom, and he thought, oh, my gosh, I hear somebody. I've left him at the top. So he went all the way back up those stairs, and if you've ever been there, you know it is a lot of stairs because he needed to go get them. He got to the top, and nobody was there. So he started to head back downstairs, and then he heard the same giggling, but it wasn't coming from above him. It was coming down below him. So he raced downstairs trying to find this mysterious person, and again, nobody was there. So maybe the little girls still roam around looking for someone to play hide-and-seek with. Who knows? The girls are, though, however, the most reported spirits and even apparitions seen on the grounds. And they've been seen on the grounds playing or sitting on benches that the trail... There's trails around the lighthouse you can walk around, and they've been seen sitting on benches on those trails that go around the lighthouse. Or they've even been seen standing with a group where someone has mistaked this ghost child for someone else's real child. And I can tell you I've been to the lighthouse during the day and the night. And, yeah, there's just something there. Um, My most vivid experience was... When I was there at night, uh, we were walking around the grounds of the lighthouse. And we were looking at the tower. We were just kind of, you know, they say it's haunted. Let's go see if we can see anything. You know how that goes. So we were walking around looking at the tower. When we heard giggling and movement beside us, there's big trees right outside the fence that surrounds the lighthouse, uh, actual grounds. So we were standing by these big trees. I want to say they're oak trees. And we heard giggling and movement. And we looked, and there's nobody there. And there's four adults, and we don't have children. And there's just nobody, but we all heard this giggling. So we brushed it off, and we went back to looking around, and I felt something tug on my hand like a little kid. Ice cold. I froze. That was it. I was done for the night. Um, The other people that I was with, one had an experience of something tugging on their pants leg, and you could hear things at the base of the lighthouse. We weren't, we couldn't get over the, or we weren't supposed to go over the fence. Um, and so we didn't check that out, but that was probably one of my weirdest experiences as an adult going to this lighthouse that I've been to numerous times and having something grab my hand. It was just, it was creepy. Um, so when they say St. Augustine is haunted, it really is haunted. Um, If you go to the lighthouse and you get a chance to look around, just know that something's probably watching you as well. So the next place I want to tell you about in St. Augustine is actually in downtown, and it's the Spanish Military Hospital. And the hospital is located at 3 Avalese Street, which is one of the oldest streets in the uh, city. And the museum actually covers the second Spanish period, which was from 1784 to 1821, and it talks about their medical practices at the time. It's kind of an interesting place. Now, the building was purchased during the British occupation of the city and remodeled from a hospital to a dwelling. I don't know about you guys, but I don't know if I'd ever want to live in a hospital or a former hospital. Now, the original hospital had been a three-part facility consisting of the Hospital West, Hospital East, and the Apothecary. Now, the Apothecary was actually the only part that was still standing at the time of the British invasion, and it was the one that was turned into a house. Now, the three parts plus the outer buildings uh, were... A hospital for a military only. No open to the public. So the military and the staff are the only ones that could actually go and be helped there. Now, I told you that there was three parts and only one remained. The Hospital West actually burned down in 1818. Um, and then the hospitals continued just to stay open. Just, okay, well, we don't have that part anymore. And it really, it did stay open until 1823 when it closed, which is a couple years after the Spanish period had ended. Now, the Hospital East was still standing even after it closed, and of course, it's St. Augustine, so something was going to happen to it, and the Hospital East actually also burned in 1895. Now, the only part that's actually remaining today was the Watson House, um, and this is the part that was turned into the dwelling, the apothecary that I told you about. 
So the St. Augustine Historical Restoration and Preservation Commissions were the ones who decided that they were just going to reconstruct it. Um, it's a long lost piece of history and it was really important to the town. So they wanted to reconstruct the Spanish military hospital just as it appeared in the 1790s. So they reconstructed it and they thought that it was a great thing and they decided that someone had suggested let's turn it into a medical hospital or a medical museum, uh, kind of a recreation of the hospital. And they, people thought that was a great idea. They loved it. So they actually opened it officially in 1968. You can tour it. It is open to the public. Uh, they have a full sur surgical demonstration. And that's kind of set up to show you the procedures that were done at the time, which I don't know, probably were barbaric compared to what we have today. And, of course, they had the apothecary that showed how the medicines were made in the herb garden where they used to get the stuff to make the medicines. So you can see all these still today in St. Augustine. But the museum is said to be heavily, heavily active uh, with lots of people to f that feel sad or just a heavy presence just walking through the building. Now, <laughs> the reconstruction of the building in the 1800s actually uncovered something very interesting or creepy or a little bit of both. It uncovered thousands of human bones that were buried beneath the hospital. I don't know about you guys, but that's just, I would just be like, nope, not going to mess with this area. But they did. And uh, they actually researched some of the bones and they found that the hospital sat on an old Timucuan burial ground, which is the Indians that were in the area of St. Augustine during the original, uh, before, before the Spanish really took over. Now, the building is said to give off an eerie feeling, and it could be from all these lost souls. It could be from the mass burial. It could be really from anything, um, and it really runs the gamut of weird or strange things happening in this building. I mean, you can hear people moaning, screaming, cries of anguish, um, misty apparitions, bad feelings, voices, phantom footsteps. Really, anything and everything seems to happen on this property. Uh, the weirdest thing, though, is that people tend to see the outline of people laying on replica hospital beds. Like, there's just a body laying there, but you can't see it. Now, me personally, I have never been to this museum, and I'll tell you why. Every time I tried to go, it either didn't work out, or I would get all the way to the door, and it would just be the weirdest, creepiest, I just didn't want to go in there kind of feeling. So I never fully got to go into the military hospital and I don't even know if I'm sad that I didn't get to go um because I just don't I don't think that it's just something that I I don't know I just I didn't get a good feeling um I know a lot of people go there I know it's actually one of the top visited things in St. Augustine it just apparently wasn't gonna be for me which is fine now so the next place I want to talk about in our ghost tour of St. Augustine is actually a really pretty one it's a cute, charming bed and breakfast called Casa de Sueños, or House of Dreams. And if you walk past it, it just looks like a normal, nice, charming bed and breakfast sitting on the streets of St. Augustine. And it is right in downtown, so it's really near everything. Now, the house itself actually dates back pretty far. Uh, it sits on Cordova Street, which, is, which was an original barrier for the actual original St. Augustine. Um, it sat on the border of the Rosario Line, which was an earthen defensive wall built to protect colonial St. Augustine from the British. So it was there when the Indians were there. Uh, it was there when they were trying to protect themselves from the British or the colonists. And so it's, it's a very old area of St. Augustine. Uh, I know it's all old, but this is one of the older parts that really has a, a, a history to it. Now the house that you see today was actually built in 1904 though as a single family home and it was part of Henry Flagler's real estate company the man that revamped St. Augustine and it didn't sit it didn't sit empty for long even Mr. George Cooley who uh, would actually go on to build the house that Scarlett O'Hara sits in today lived in the house for a time while he was looking around the city uh, it eventually did go to the Carcaba family uh, they were the ones that really expanded it to what you see today. They took it from that single family home and really made it extravagant and added the beautiful windows and the rooms. And it's just a really beautiful house. Now, it didn't just sit as a house for a while. Um, it actually passed from the Carcaba family to go on to be the Garcia Funeral Home in the mid-1900s. That's right, a funeral home. 
And it wasn't just a funeral home. It was actually a very uh, prominent funeral home in St. Augustine. But of course, St. Augustine, everything goes through changes. So it turned into offices in the late 1970s. And it was eventually bought and created to be the Casa de Sueños in the late 1990s. Now, the, ca- the Casa has an interesting past, especially since it at one time catered to the dead instead of the living for many, many years. I'm sure that added to some of the heavy feelings you can get there. And the Garcia Funeral Home, like I said, was considered to be one of the most successful in the city and probably one of the weirdest. Uh, the house was bought by the undertaker in the 1940s after it was purchased from the Karkawa family. And he opened a funeral home and he literally stayed there until 1960s, 1970s. And it was known by locals and they would even encourage them to walk in and make their future arrangements. Um, Because it is on one of the main streets in St. Augustine. It's actually kind of close to Flagler College. Uh, And the large windows, because the house is known for having beautiful large windows, it actually would show off the latest caskets that you could be buried in. And the front yard was filled with top-of-the-line granite headstones for people to choose from for their future graves. So could you imagine walking past that? You're just walking downtown St. Augustine, and there's a casket. And looks like somebody decorated for Halloween early. Oh, nope. That's just a funeral home. I don't know about you guys. I would be... I don't know if I'd want to live next to that. Because there's some houses... Well, they're mostly buildings now. But a lot of them used to be houses, apparently, that people did live in. And so that would just be kind of creepy to look over at your neighbor and be like, Oh, it's just a funeral home. I don't know about you guys. not the ideal neighbor I would want um but of course the house passed through a couple times and finally became this bed and breakfast that we know today um and of course that as soon as these people bought it to make this into this beautiful bed and breakfast the ghost did not keep themselves hidden it was very very apparent that it was haunted one of the first hauntings that, that the owners reported was that their belongings would be flung out of boxes i guess you could say they're helping them unpack uh they would hear noises strange Phantom footsteps, tapping noises, moving. Items would disappear and reappear in random places. Um, They say that the weirdest event they had there was they had purchased an artesian candle for decorations for the casa before it opened. And the candle was still in a box it was purchased in. And suddenly it jumped out of the box and landed on the table. I'm just going to say the ghost probably just wanted to help you decorate. Um, And of course, the ghost does have a name. The name is Randolph. It's the most notorious ghost in the casa, and it's tend to make guests feel a little uneasy. Uh, they report feeling being watched, seeing things out of the corner of their eye, of course, getting weird photographs. Now, they've named the ghost Randolph, but in all honesty, we don't know if there ever was really a Randolph there or if there's more than one Randolph doing these hauntings. Um, but Randolph is the ghost for the Casa de Sueños. And he is well known. Uh, Another weird thing that they say happens at the Casa is that um, there's a report of shadow people. And it's usually a couple, a man and a woman. And they're just seen walking through the parking area of the Casa. Just doing their own thing. And it's actually not the people staying in the bed and breakfast that see it. It's usually the ones that are across the street that tend to report this activity. They said that the figures are supposed to be darker than dark very well outlined, and usually vanish pretty quickly after being spotted. The house is full of history, both happy and sad, so I'm sure this adds to the feelings, experiences, and things that still linger at this bed and breakfast. Uh, It's a really beautiful place. I would say you want to stay because it's close to downtown, um, but that's really up to you. Um, Fun fact, though, about this, I'm told that at the bed and breakfast that the honeymoon suite at this inn used to be the embalming room. (laughs) It's one way to spend a honeymoon. Um, Moving on, guys. The next uh, stop I'm going to talk about in Haunted St. Augustine is actually one that I just mentioned. It's also one that's super popular. It's Scarlett O'Hara's. This Gone with the Wind inspired establishment is a well-known place in St. Augustine for good food, good drinks, and of course, good haunts. I love this place. I absolutely do love Scarlett O'Hara's. It's just a great place. The food is amazing. Um, There's a cool outdoor bar. It's just one of the places I recommend, not just because it's haunted, but just because it's fun. Uh, The development of this area, though, actually dates back to the late 1600s. This is where most of the construction workers would stay for the Castillo. Uh, They all lived in this area, and this area actually did turn into a neighborhood. 
before it's what we see today. Um, but because it's St. Augustine and we know that they've been through fires, floods, plagues, pirates, and who knows what else, the area was actually destroyed during the siege of 1702. So, redevelopment. The area was actually resettled by the Menorcans in the 1800s. Uh, but of course, as all things do, people move on and it get run, gets run down. So, they're going to redevelop it again. And that's kind of what we see as part of it today. Now, the restaurant itself sits at 70 Hippolyta Street, which is kind of the corner of uh, Hippolyta and Cordova. It's in a really busy part of town in the back part. Um, the place you see, though, is actually two houses that were combined to be this one Scarlett O'Hara's. Uh, the houses that were there were said to be built by Mr. George Cooley, the man we talked about first living in the Casa de Sueños. And the house was actually built as a request of Mr. Cooley's soon-to-be fiancé's father, he wanted a house for his daughter. He wanted to make sure that Mr. Cooley could take care of her. And he asked him to show that he could do this by building her this house. And so he did. He built this house. Dad was happy. Mr. Cooley was happy. Time to ask the daughter to marry him. So, and they were sure. They were sure this woman was just going to, she was in love with him and she was going to say yes. And she didn't. She actually turned him down for a soldier at the fort. Can you imagine that? You're a wealthy businessman and you've been turned down for a, so, a soldier at the fort. I don't know about you, but if I was Mr. Cooley, I'd be slightly embarrassed and probably also a little pissed. Um, but I mean, hopefully she did what was right in her heart. But you still kind of feel for Mr. Cooley. I mean, he was devastated and rightfully so. And that's where they say he kind of started a downhill slide. Uh, he, he didn't really want to do anything. He kind of stopped going out. Uh, he didn't really do public uh, things anymore, business deals. They all kind of just stopped for him, you know? Like, he was so sure of this thing, it just it didn't work. And so now he's like, well, what do I do? So what did he do? He actually dated another woman for a short time and even ended up marrying her. Unfortunately, though, this was short-lived. Mr. Cooley was found dead in his bathtub in 1911. Some say he was murdered. Some say he was murdered by the soldier that his lover left him for. I don't understand that. Um, some say that he was killed by his wife. Some say he was killed by an overdose. Um, nobody really knows for sure. They did find bruising around his neck that indicated a sign of struggle, but it was said that Mr. Cooley was, had tried to commit suicide previous in the previous weeks to him actually being found dead, so nothing was ever proven. It was inconclusive. Um, which is sad because, you know, you've, kind of want to know what happened you hope he didn't suffer uh and so mr cooley's house went to his family and his his uh widow and they actually resided in the house until about the 1950s uh before they boarded it up and left for town now when they left they left everything including the original bathtub now this bathtub for back then was beautiful bathtub um and if you've ever been to scarlet's you know where i'm going um, there's actually a bathtub upstairs at Scarlet's, and that's part of the story of Mr. Mr. Cooley. Uh, but of course, the house stood empty, and it was finally converted into Scarlet O'Hara's, where it's really operated for the last 40 years, and it really is a fun place to go. Now, back to Mr. Cooley. If you ever go upstairs, and the upstairs is called the Ghost Bar, um, that is the room that Mr. Cooley was said to have died in. The original plumbing was said to be where the bar is today if you ever go upstairs. And Mr. Cooley's picture also hangs on the wall upstairs. Uh, that's kind of leading to why they think that the upstairs is notoriously haunted. Um, and a lot of stuff really does happen in that whole um, restaurant or house. But um, it really is upstairs is, is way more of a feeling. It's just, it's an eerie kind of place. Although it doesn't feel eerie when you're packed up there with a bunch of people drinking. I mean, it's fun, but it's definitely a ghost bar. Uh, bottles move around, glasses move around. And I don't mean you set them on water and they slide like these things move. Menus go flying across the room on their own. And of course, to me, the weirdest thing has to do with the bathrooms. And I've actually experienced this. Um, the women's bathroom, you'll go into the bathroom and the door won't let you out. Like someone's holding it shut. Now, no one's blocking you from leaving. You're standing there staring at the door. It's also a small bathroom. You're going to know if somebody's in there with you. And then the other thing is, is that 
you'll you'll swear you'll see somebody go in the bathroom and you'll think they come out and then you go and it's locked and you're like oh, okay I, I didn't see them they they must still be in there so you step out and you wait and then a couple seconds later somebody else comes up opens the door and goes in like it just didn't want to open for you i've had that happen a couple times and i've seen that happen to a couple other people the other weird thing is that it is not just the women's it's the men's the men's bathroom has stories of guys going to the bathrooms and then having somebody patting them on the back again small bathroom you're gonna know if somebody's in there with you um that's just really creepy to me um let let people pee in peace um the other thing that i think is i've heard of stories of this one is um so mr cooley was a gentleman and he treated ladies as such and so it's a college town There are people up in the bar, and you know how when you get to drinking, you get a little more self-confidence, liquid courage, as you could call it, and you get one, you really get one shot to hit on somebody. Like, once they say no, that's it. That's the answer. You've got one shot. And so, you know, you can see when guys get turned down, they get a little hurt, a little pride. It's gone. And so they want to run their mouth. They want to say something. They want to be basically an asshole. So you'll see guys go in the bathroom and then come out with this big old knot, like red mark on their forehead. And again, small bathroom. You're going to know if somebody was already in there. They said that they have had people shove their, get their heads shoved into the wall or the pipe above the toilet. So it seems that Mr. Cooley doesn't like it when guys aren't so gentlemanly. And when he thinks that a guy is being rude to a woman, he seems to tell them in his own way. And that's just the upstairs, guys. The downstairs is still haunted in its own right. Uh, They have a phantom bar patron who likes to pull out bar stools to have a drink, goes to sit on it, and then disappears as quickly as you spot him with the bar stool still being pulled out from the bar. The outside bar that I mentioned that I love also has its own haunts. I've experienced these. Uh, Glasses fall off shelves. That was probably one of the weirdest experiences I've had in St. Augustine. Uh, The wine glasses on the rack. It's not near the front. It comes flying off and shatters on the ground. Everybody kind of looks at each other, shrugs, and goes about their business. But it's still a weird thing to see. Bottles, of course, move and clink. And stools out there move on their own as well. But, of course, all that being said, the weirdest haunting in Scarlett O'Hara still goes back to Mr. Cooley. As I said, that there's a picture of Mr. Cooley upstairs next to a bathtub. It's odd. It very is odd, but you can, you know, it's got the little story of Mr. Cooley. But it's the only place in the bar that this picture is said to stay on the wall when they hang it. And they've put it in different places only to come back the next morning to find it laying on the floor with the screws next to it. Uh, Mr. Cooley wants to remain upstairs in his home. And so that's where the picture stays to this day. They also have one day where they close. They close on Christmas. And they are said to have left, leave a shot out for Mr. Cooley. And they'll come in the day after to find the shot gone. And of course, they've had plenty of reports with their cameras and their security systems and everything going crazy. And that's just, that's really all over downtown. Like, nobody's security system works right down there. So, Mr. Cooley just wants to stay in his home. And you can't really fault him. He did build it out of love. And he did live there until he died. So, it's still his place where he feels at home. And, of course, you know, he may experience that heartbreakingness there, but he does love it. And you can tell, especially hearing all the stories of people, oh, everything, oh, Mr. Cooley did it. So, it's a fun place. Next time you go to Scarlett O'Hara's, maybe say hi to him. uh, Or just don't give him a reason to say hi to you. Now, the next place I want to talk about is another one of my favorites in St. Augustine. It's my favorite place to eat. But it's also the story of one woman's love of her home. So the home I'm talking about is known today as Harry's Seafood Bar and Grill. And it sits at 46 Avenida Menendez. So it's right on the bay, the waterfront. If you ever get to go and you can eat upstairs outside overlooking the, the bayfront, it's a beautiful, beautiful place to sit while you enjoy some amazing food. And this ghost is haunting. Uh, and it's really seen kind of all over the restaurant, but mainly in the upstairs part of the restaurant. And this ghost has a name, and it's, we know exactly who it is. It's Catalina de Porras. She lived in this home until 1763 when she was 10. And her family decided to go to Cuba with the rest of St. Augustine because Spanish rule had ended and British rule was beginning, and they just did not want to do that. They were 
true to the, to the Spanish, and they just didn't want to live there anymore. So they left and went to Cuba. Of course, Catalina never forgot her old home. She loved it. And unlike most of us, she was actually able to go back to her home one day. I know a lot of people, oh, I want to go live in my childhood home, and it's not what you imagined, or it's not there anymore for whatever reason. But Catalina was able to do this. She was able to go and regain her home. So when Florida once again went to Spanish rule about 21 years after she left, she left Cuba and she returned and she reclaimed her old family home. And she was so happy, uh, but unfortunately she didn't get to live there long as she passed away a few years after she was able to reclaim it. But she's never left. She's still there enjoying her home. And you can see her today. Like I said, she's usually sitting upstairs near the women's upstairs bathroom. She's spotted in a white gown disappearing into the walls. Harry's is just a beautiful place, so it's not surprising to me that someone's love of this um, house lives on many years after they don't. All right, I'm going to talk about the last stop on the tour, and this is a famous one, and this is something we've talked about in my other podcast, and that's the Castillo de San Marcos. I could not take us on a ghost tour of St. Augustine without talking about the fort. And the fort that St. Augustine is most known for is also one of the most notoriously haunted sites in the city. It was built between 1672 and 1695, and it was a way to protect the city from the invasion of the British or soon-to-be other countries, such as the colonies. Now, the fort actually saw many battles. It was sieged upon a couple times, um, pirates and things like that. Uh, And that's possibly one of the reasons these spirits roam these grounds. It's had a very dark history that has surrounded it, and I don't just mean the grassy moat. The fort actually held prisoners of war as well and deserters uh, who all left their mark on the fort in one way or another. One of the darkest stories of the fort actually involves a headless ghost that roams the fort's grounds. Now, they're not sure who it is completely, but they believe that it could be that of Osceola. And Osceola was a Native American leader and a member of the Seminole tribe. He was a well-respected and very smart and cunning chief who managed to avoid capture until he was tricked into giving himself up because of a false promise treaty. He was taken to the Castillo with 200 of his men, and the chief was in poor health at the time of his capture. He was said to be suffering from malaria and abscesses. Now, the Spanish actually let a doctor treat him. They weren't completely barbaric. And heal him. And, of course, as he got to get to this doctor saw him, he became close to the doctor. They became friends. And eventually, Osceola was transferred from St. Augustine to Fort Moultrie in South Carolina. Now, Osceola actually did die in South Carolina. So why does his spirit still roam St. Augustine? Well, the doctor that became good friends with him decided that the best way he could remember his friend was to cut off Osceola's head and preserve it. He also took some of Osceola's items, uh, which is a big no-no in any culture, but definitely this. He desecrated a body, and he upset the spirit. He took his head, and he had a witch doctor preserve it in alcohol, and he would show it off from time to time, almost like a trophy. And a lot of people still think that he haunts St. Augustine because of what happened to his head, and since his body and spirit are not at rest, and that's where the doctor went back to. People have reported seeing a headless apparition, and in all possibility, it really could be Osceola, but it also could be any one of the Native Americans who were executed at this fort, or really any other prisoners of war that were held and executed at the fort. Now, the Castillo has another dark legend, because why just have one? Let's have a couple. And this dark legend from the fort actually belongs to a pair of secret lovers. No, I'm not talking about Romeo and Juliet, but something slightly worse. A wannabe archaeologist was walking around the fort one day, and he felt that there was like a hollow spot or he noticed that there was a caving in part on the fort wall. So they investigated it and they actually found a pair of skeletons chained to the wall next to each other with only a tiny gap between their fingertips. This is horrible. This is just, that's, that's brutally hard. Um, so the space was open, the skeletons were found and then they had to figure out who they were. The story goes back many years. In 1784, Colonel Garcia Martin Marti was sent to St. Augustine with a young wife, Dolores. He was assigned a new assistant upon arriving, Captain Manuel Abela, who was handsome, charming, and also possibly in love with the colonel's wife. 
Dolores and Manuel started a relationship behind Garcia's back, as Garcia was said to be a cold man who was far more concerned of the fort than with his wife. And the affair went on, apparently for quite a while, until Garcia met with Manuel one day. Manuel, sorry. And when he was meeting him, he smelled his wife's perfume, and he knew. Oh, he knew they were having an affair. And just as soon as he knew, Dolores and Manuel were never seen again. That's it. That's the last day they were seen. And, of course, people questioned Dolores' disappearance, but the colonel told them that she had been sick with it and went to stay with an aunt and then decided to go back to Spain. And he explained that Manuel had been assigned to Cuba. Now, he was the colonel. He wasn't questioned much further after that, even if everybody kind of knew that the story seemed strange. They couldn't prove anything had happened, and they certainly couldn't find these two people. So what had happened to them? The colonel had chained them and walled them up in the walls of the, for- the fort for this affair. And you can still smell the sweet perfume wafting through the fort, or even hear haunting screams at night. The feeling of being watched can also be reported from the fort, and a feeling of sadness. Now, I can attest to you the screams at night. That is probably one of the most vivid experiences I've ever had at St. Augustine. And if I had not been a believer before that, I would have been a believer right in that moment. I was walking through St. Augustine, and it was like, God, it had to be like 1 a.m. So, of course, there's not a lot of people out. And we were parked at the fort parking because it was free after a certain time. And I was walking with my husband and we were crossing the street. And there's a, you could look ahead on the seawall, there was a couple. And they were walking, dark shadows, you can't really make anything out, but you can see two figures. And then they just disappear. Like, okay, maybe they went around the corner, you can't see them anymore. This is followed by the most blood-curdling, agonizing, horrible... Better than any sound clip scream I've ever heard in real life, in a movie, anything. And it chilled you to the bone. It was so scary. And it was like, all right, I'm out. Like, I'm out. That's it. I'm done. I don't know where it's coming from. I don't even want to go see if anybody's alive. It was just that bone chillingly scary. Better than any horror movie. Um... So I can attest that some weird things happened to the fort. And in case you're wondering, yes, I did look at the news the next day. No, no one had died. So there's no explanation for that scream. But whoever or whatever it came from was a very tortured soul. And that's just one part of the fort. The fort is still said to be full of many other lost souls who still roam the fort. I mean, the fort sits on Matanzas. That means murder in Spanish. And it got its name from... um, where they killed the the French. So you know that there's dark history here. And you can still see apparitions patrolling the walls at night. Uh, If you look up, sometimes you can see a a fort. uh, I guess it would have been a sentry. Hmm. I don't know what the actual proper term is, but it's one of the soldiers that would patrol the tops of the fort at night, walking back and forth between the, the bastions. And... You can see that there's a lantern type thing moving back and forth, but it's there's no light there. There's not a human holding it. It's just a really weird floating light above the fort. Um, of course, the screams. You can see figures walking on the drawbridge or pacing the moat. Strange lights move around, and you'll get some really interesting photos that show apparitions coming out of the fort consistently. Uh, the smiling ghost is probably one of the most op- often captured. He was said to be a soldier who was sentenced to death by garroting, and when they tried to kill him, the, the garrot broke. And if you don't know what that is, it's a, it's a really evil way to die. Basically, they put you in a chair, they strap you down, and they put a brace around your neck or a rope, and then they twist it until it tightens and chokes you to death. Uh, and as they were trying to kill this man, they, it broke. And a friar stepped in and said... You can't, you can't try to kill him again. This is God. God had spared him. So the man actually went on to help build some of the fort and became well known, but he apparently never left. And every now and then you can still see him in pictures to this day smiling. And then you can see a second smile. And that's actually the large scar on his neck that's visible in the photos. You can roam the fort at night. Uh, The fort itself is not open, but the moat and the grounds around it are. Um, Go at your own risk. You never really know what you're going to see or hear. Also, be careful of the homeless. Uh, sometimes they like to hang out near the fort since it's free open ground. But 
Just be ready for anything. Anytime you're really roaming through St. Augustine, because St. Augustine has no shortage of hauntings. From hearing phantom people moving through Flagler College in the early morning hours, seeing shadows move in front of you as you walk through an almost deserted street during late nights out, hearing strange sounds around you as you stay in a beautiful bread and bed and breakfast in town, smelling strange smells that don't quite belong to anything that should be around you, hearing someone whistle in your ear to turn around to see that there's no one there. I've had that happen. That was truly creepy. <laughs> Or, you know, just having a loud-ass tourist scare the crap out of you as you walk down a quiet street at night and the city's full of beautiful old buildings and you're just really intense and then there they are. Just know that you're never alone. And just make sure that whether you're roaming the streets looking for happy art scarlets or live music at trade winds, or even if you go see the Night of Lights in uh, November and December, just be careful. You're never alone. Someone's always watching you. And Florida Man is always out there. Today's Florida man is an old one. It's from 2014, and the headline kind of explains itself. Florida man accused of killing roommate and then asking Siri where to hide the body. This man asked Siri where to hide the body the same day his roommate went missing. I mean, I don't even know what to say to that. Like, I guess Siri isn't as thoughtful or as know-it-all as we thought she was. All right, guys, I hope that you've enjoyed my Halloween-inspired Haunted St. Augustine podcast. I did get a couple of stories from you guys, um, but it was you guys are amazing for even telling me that you've been, you've been to St. Augustine and that you got haunted, but um, nobody asked me to share there, so I won't. But thank you for sending me those. They were fun to read. Some of you I sympathize with. Um, every hotel down there is haunted, or up there is haunted, so don't be surprised. Um, no matter where you stay, if you walk out with a story, just make sure that it's inspired by spirits and not, you know, boozy kind of spirits. <laughs> All right, guys, I hope you have a great and safe Halloween. Sam Hain, Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead, whichever one you're going to prefer or celebrate. If you have a second, please leave a five-star review. I would really appreciate it. Don't forget to like or subscribe or whatever you do on whatever platform you're listening on to don't to um, keep track and not miss out on any new episodes. I hope you guys will join me for a more sunny side of Florida as we've made it through spook, spooky October. Hopefully you've learned some interesting things about Florida or those people who roam Florida or those spirits that still roam Florida. Either way, thank you for listening. I really appreciate and love you guys. Stay safe, drink water, wear your sunscreen, and always, always, guys, that is your daily dose of sunshine.